My understanding for muting is uh, that this is because it's set up as a speaker stage. I get the voice channel and um, you have to be specifically, I think, unmuted by an admin. Um, Estri, can you confirm? Okay. So one thing I have unfortunately discovered is with my setup, I have slides, but if I use the slides, I cannot see the chat, which is unfortunate because I like talking to you guys. Um, so kind of a quick vote. Should we skip the slides and I'll just kind of talk through them or would uh, people prefer to see the slides knowing that I won't necessarily see your uh, comments immediately unless someone tells me. Oh, we're gamers. Controversy is what we live off of. <laughs> Sounds like for the most part, people are okay with uh, no slides. I'm going to use be looking at my slides regardless to keep myself on track. So don't feel bad that uh, they won't get used. You just won't see them. Um, all right, let's skip using the slides just so that I can kind of see chat, um, at least showing you guys the slides. Um, So kind of going through, quick breakdown of uh, how this is going to get kind of organized so that if you guys decide, hey, this really isn't what I signed up for, you can, I don't know, go to the other panel or go do laundry or something exciting like that. So I'm going to go through some kind of key terms and concepts, which is basically me letting my lit nerd loose. Um, if you didn't like your literature classes in school, um, that's your issue. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what makes a good antagonist. And finally, we'll talk about applying that to play. Uh, any questions on that or concerns? Sounds good. All right. So first kind of key concept is protagonist. Um, you've probably heard this term before. The protagonist is not necessarily the hero. Um, they are the main character. They're the ones who kind of drive the action. In the case of simming, this is the PC. So these are the characters that we play. Um, and in counter to that, we have antagonists. Now, just like the protagonist isn't necessarily a hero, antagonists aren't necessarily bad guys. Um, for some examples, um, antagonists who aren't bad guys, probably three common categories. Um, because, okay, so sorry, I missed a point here. So antagonists are those who are in conflict with our PCs. Again, not necessarily bad guys. Authority figures are a common category of antagonist who's not necessarily going to be a bad guy, in quotes. Um, some examples of these, uh, for those of you old enough to have seen the Fugitive movie or the TV series, 
the U.S. Marshal Sam Gerard. Um, for those who watch Leverage, and if you have not, I highly recommend it. It is a great piece of writing. Sterling, the character, was very much an antagonist who was not a bad guy. In fact, the writers have said they had a rule in that series writing it. Sterling could never lose because Sterling was the good guy. He just wasn't the protagonist. Um, Javert from Les Mis is another good example. Um, and kind of going outside the area of law enforcement, um, one of my favorite examples, Kelvin's parents in Kelvin and Hobbes are a great example of antagonists who aren't bad guys. Maybe from Calvin's point of view, but most of us, I think, are of an age where we, uh, unfortunately, for better or worse, relate to his parents very much. Um, so, you know, authority figures, people who are basically standing in opposition, but aren't bad guys. Um, second category, you're going to see a lot of antagonists in that, that like this, rivals. So... Um, Toy Story, Buzz Lightyear was in very in many ways an antagonist within the story. Um, not a bad guy, in fact, very much, you know, a hero character in a lot of ways, but in opposition to Woody, um, who was our protagonist. So um some other examples to an extent of a little bit kind of a gray area, but like Fitzwilliam Darcy in Pride and Prejudice. He's kind of, you know. Lizzie's social rival in some ways, you know, in opposition to her views. Uh, so rivals are, you know, any underdog sports movie where the other sports team is just the better team and not, you know, the team who got to be better because they cheated. That's an antagonist who's just a rival. Yes, bad news bears, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, you know, I can think of... Um, Pretty much like it for those who've seen Lower Decks, the Titan in a lot of ways could be argued is, you know, they're the better ship. They're the antagonist um, in some ways or an antagonist. Obviously, you're not limited to one, especially in kind of the settings where we play, where we have multiple plot threads going. Finally non-intelligent antagonists. So Moby Dick in Moby Dick is a good example. Um, you can advertise in the advertisement. It's not just not here. Yeah. Um, though I will say, I, yeah, I play on a lower decks uh, sim. Um, and it was finally a great time to break out my empathy is a terrible thing character. But um, yeah, non-intelligent characters are another example because they lack the capability of being, you know, evil or bad. They don't have really a moral viewpoint. So Moby Dick is a good example. Bruce the shark from Jaws. Terrifying antagonist. You really can't argue that a shark eating is, you know, evil or a villain. Um, they kind of lack intelligence. We saw a lot of these in Star Trek over the years of various, you know, space anomalies and strange life forms who weren't really evil, but just didn't know what they were doing kind of thing. Um, yep. The whale probe is a great example of that. There's no intelligence there. But it, it almost destroyed Earth. because Apparently it was badly designed. I can think of some people who would really want to speak to the engineers. Um, Okay, Jaws 4 does not, anything after the first Jaws is, is, does not count. But yes, the whale movie is the best movie. We don't even call it Voyage Home in my house. It's it's just the whale movie. Um, so again, antagonist does not necessarily mean bad guy, does not necessarily mean a villain, just means someone in conflict with the PCs or the protagonists. That being said, villains are often antagonists. Um, we can probably off the top of our head all think of tons of examples of villains. Um, 
you know, both in Star Trek and out. So from outside, the Sheriff of Nottingham in uh, Robin Hood, Darth Vader, um, Ursula, the, the Little Mermaid. Uh, Harry Potter is interesting and it gives us, yep, Khan gives us two very different types of villains. Uh, Voldemort, who's your classic sort of big bad, and Dolores Umbridge, who is the most hated character in the series, because we have all met someone like this. She is petty, and she's nasty. Um, the Star Trek equivalent to her would probably be Kai Wen, who is honestly probably one of my favorite villains. Um, you hear some people say, villains think they are the heroes of their own story and she is very much in that thread you know if you asked her do you think you're, you're you know you're in the right do you think you're the hero she'd be like yeah i suffered you know in in during the occupation and some guy just who isn't even bajoran comes in and suddenly the prophets love him and that's just wrong and horrible um well kind of on the voldemort end you almost have is more ducat who personally i think if you asked ducat if he thought he was the hero he would laugh um does he think he's doing the right thing he thinks he's doing the right thing for himself you know he, he's very much your classic motivated by selfishness whereas uh Kaiwin kind of is but it's not as pure as his you know she thinks she's doing the right thing for all of Bejor. it just happens to also be the right thing for her <laughs> um for those of you who do not know me, DS9 is my favorite Star Trek series. I think it is the peak of what Star Trek can be. You will hear me use a lot of examples from that series. Okay, good. We have a lot of people who also like DS9, who have very good taste. Um, so yeah, villains are a category we're all really familiar with. Um, but I will note that just like antagonists are not always heroes or sorry protagonists are not always heroes villains are not always antagonists we do occasionally see villain protagonists now there are pluses and minuses to a villain protagonist i would argue that for the most part they do not belong in the sim setting that we play in and that's because to an extent there are really tone wise it does not always work so there are basically three general outcomes when you have a villain protagonist the one that potentially works within setting of a role playing is going to be the villain protagonist who has the redemption arc who becomes a better person and if not a hero less of a villain um for an example for that one um, you know, you can kind of look to in Buffy the Vampire Slayer Spike's story arc. Yep, Wreck-It Ralph, Megamind might kind of work for that. Um, but ultimately, yeah, they, they kind of, they have some sort of redemption. They have some sort of, I am now not a bad guy, even if you're not necessarily a good guy. The other two outcomes for villain protagonists, one is sort of, wide-scale destruction and darkness you know you see this with walter white and breaking bad um patrick bateman in american psycho um you know uh michael corleone kind of in some of the godfather uh characters that just it they, it, they kind of just take everybody down with them and I, I would hope i don't have to explain why that doesn't work well in a sim setting where we're kind of being cooperative um it 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 gets kind of dismal it gets bleak and then everybody dies which is not a fun thing to necessarily play um unless everyone agrees i mean maybe you, you have let's like let's we're, we're gonna end the game let's go out in a uh huge explosion yeah in all evil tabletop rpg if everyone goes in kind of knowing yeah well, I don't know about glory, but um, in a blaze of fire and villainy, certainly. Um, but it doesn't work well for a long-term game. Um, 
the final possibility with a villain protagonist is failure. Um, so examples of this, uh, Wiley Coyote, and um, yeah, it, it doesn't always, it, friendships tend to suffer unless you, everyone is like, yeah, let's just see how much we, we can trash everything together. Sometimes it's cathartic, but, um, but yeah, so failure is your Wiley Coyote, your pinky in the brain. Um, they set out to do evil and they're really, really bad at it. Yeah, Harry Mudd is potentially, um. An example, uh, I I, I kind of joke that like, uh, yep, uh, Q when he they made him human kind of fits into that kind of archetype of that. You're fun, but you're really sad and pathetic. <laughs> um, could you play something like that in in a sim? Um, if it had the right tone, potentially, I don't know how much of a PC potential that would be. Um, could be kind of chaotic. Uh, but certainly, you know, not as a protagonist, but loser villains certainly have their place. Um, I'm going to touch on, it's not a concept here that's not exactly protagonist, antagonist, ex but. Um, We've all heard of anti-heroes, right? I want you to mentally raise your hand if you think you know what an anti-hero is. Now I want you to put it down because you're at least partially wrong. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yes, I I play a kind of an anti-hero. Oh, no. um, one of my first characters that I've played, um, he was originally an NPC villain that has become an anti-hero. He's uh, he's learning to become better at being humane and uh, nice. <laughs> I don't know if he's actually succeeded. Yeah, it's there. I think are many characters that try and don't succeed. And failure is its own, I think, legitimate story option. Um, you just have to, I think, go into knowing that you're not going to necessarily succeed. Yeah. Um, so. Talking about anti-heroes now, I want to, they're usually defined as a protagonist who is not a villain, but doesn't have the classic heroic qualities. Um, so some of the classic kind of, you know, traditional hero types, they have courage, they have ingenuity, they have a, idealism. They're often high social status, lots of charisma. Um, so, you know, people will point out, for instance, Willie Loman of Death of a Salesman. If you guys had to read that, too, in high school, I did not like that. But, you know, they'll point out it's right in his name. Low Man. Um, Huck Finn is another kind of classic anti-hero. Um, and then you get kind of to the more modern. You have, you know, your Han, Han Solo, um, the dude in the Big Lebowski, Robin Hood, um, the Adams Family. I would actually argue that in today's era, most protagonists are probably anti-heroes. Yeah, the Punisher. Um, so, yeah, an anti-hero is the idea that um, pretty much, yeah. How many of us have really played a character who is the straight up classic hero type? Ironically, I would argue that one of the best modern examples that comes closest was Batman in Batman the Animated Series in the 90s. Other than the vigilante thing, you know, he's rich, he's courageous, he's smart, he's strong, he's idealistic, you know, he wants to help people. Um, in a lot of ways, he's, you know, Superman is another example, so... But again, Superman is a vigilante. He doesn't get quite the same reputation as Batman as a vigilante because he operates during the day instead of at night, which says a lot about, I think, symbolism in our culture. <laughs> um, if you do it during the day, it's not a crime. Uh, ironically, 
at the same time that we were getting, you know, Batman, the animated series, we were also getting that classic gritty era of the 90s comic books of violence and dark, dismal grimness. And I, I'm actually not a big fan of the 90s comic book. I, Batman's one of my favorite characters, but that I, I the animated series, I think, definitely for me to find it in a lot of ways. All right, we got some people typing. Let's see what you guys have to say. Yeah, someone mentioned the Punisher was kind of almost like the exa exact example of what the 90s were about. Huh. True. I, like I said, once you remove the vigilante, you, there's the whole vigilante issue with Batman and his whole cohort. Um, the animated series also, I think, toned down a lot of the corruption in uh, Gotham Police that was traditional um, to the comic books, which, of course, predates even the gritty 90 era because some a lot of the... Um, idea of the vigilante came out you know that the uh whole system was corrupt and we needed somebody outside the system to save us blah 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 um so but yeah commissioner gordon in a lot of ways yes kind of more of the classic hero yeah i i don't know why people live in gotham either it's probably cheap um counterpoint to <laughs> Our anti-heroes is our anti-villains. I don't know if no income tax would be enough to make me live in Gotham. So an anti-villain, unlike an anti-hero, is essentially heroic ideals, you know, with villainous tactics applied. Probably the most common example these days is Killmonger in Black Panther. Guy had a point. He did not need to commit mass murder to make that point. Well, um, actually, I've heard that uh, Gotham is supposed to be New York City at night, and Metropolis is supposed to be New York City during the day. Um, but in terms of sort of tone, I've always associated Metropolis more with Chicago because Superman is such a Midwesterner. And I say this as a Midwesterner. Um, He's yeah, he's just very Midwest. Um, anti villain, so Killmonger is kind of our classic for an example. Um, some other examples, Magneto gets pulled up a lot if we step away from DC and into Marvel as guy has a point, maybe doesn't need to commit mass murder to make that point. Um Roy Beatty and Blade Runner committed mass crimes because he just didn't want to die. You know, that that's certainly, um, he wanted, you know, freedom and life. Uh, leverage crew are very good examples, interestingly, of an anti-villain protagonist. Um, they are absolutely committing crimes left, right, up, down, um, but for good reasons. So, in Starfleet, uh, Leverage, the Leverage is a TV series. The Leverage crew are a group. The theme of it is kind of sometimes the best good guy is a bad guy. So, it's a bunch of thieves who go and uh, commit crimes to avenge people who, uh, yep, Timothy Hutton and his whole crew. Again, probably the one of the best written series out there. If you have not seen it, please go see it. It's a beautiful piece of story creation and writing. It's like a master class onto itself. Um, was there Archie? There was a character named Archie in Leverage. Um, it was Parker's mentor. Old guy, classic thief type. Um, He uh, threatened Will Wheaton's character with his cane because he couldn't remember if it was the uh, sword cane or the uh, taser cane. And he ended up tasering his character. Oh. 
No. Yeah, there there is a character in named Archie Leach, which is actually um, Clark Gable's. I think it was Clark. Was it Clark Gable? No, it was Cary Grant's real name was Archie Leach. You can see why they had him change it. Um, so within the setting of Starfleet and Star Trek, probably one of our class most common examples of an anti-villain is going to be uh, the Maquis. You know, they want freedom. They want, you know, to beat back the Cardassians and their terrorists who kill a lot of people. Um, so, yeah, generally a lot of anti-villains for the most part fall into good goals, killing lots of people. Um, but not 100%. Again, Leverage, the Leverage crew is an example and Lord Veterinary in Discworld, if you have read that. And if you haven't, please go read it. Yep. Rotel is paved with good intentions. Um, a really great example, I think, of that was if you watched the CW series Arrow, um, the Green Arrow in the first couple seasons ran around killing people to save the city. He got past that, the whole killing thing and went from, but he started out killing people. Let's just be realistic. That's, that's not very heroic. Um, There's some overlap between anti-heroes, anti-villains, and this third category, which is sympathetic villains. Now, I'm going to say that the difference between a sympathetic villain and an anti-villain is a sympathetic villain is has no ideals behind what they're doing, but they have a motivation that we can empathize with, that we can kind of understand, okay, this is straight up villainy, but um, I can't deny that if I was in this situation, I wouldn't go villain too. We see a lot of this right now with sort of this redoing of villain backstories to make them uh, sympathetic. Yep. Thanos. I don't know about Thanos. His logic was definitely missed. He thought he had ideals and he did not. His, his, they made no sense. Um. Frankenstein's monster is a good example. I don't know how many of you guys have actually read it rather than sort of absorbed through popular culture, but um, Frankenstein creates his monster. He runs away from the monster because he's so horrified. Um, the monster then goes and kills his fiance in retaliation. Um, Frankenstein, you know, is terrible, but yep. You know, um, some other examples, uh, Madeline Pryor in the X-Men. I don't know how many of you guys remember. Wait, what am I saying? Of course, everyone knows the Phoenix Saga because they redo it like every time they turn around. But Madeline Pryor went evil because she found out that, um, yep, she was a clone of her husband's love. And when he got his actual love back, he dumped her. Um, and yeah, it, it, Scott Summers has terrible judgment. The man is absolutely, you know, just has the social skills of a lump of jello. Um, another good example, uh, Norman Bates in the Psycho movies. You know, this is a guy, you know, we have a lot. He's struggling with mental illness, uh, bad upbringing. He's seems when he's not in murderous mode to be a pretty sweet guy. Yeah, dating Emma Frost is um, not necessarily the best choice I would have made. But um, Another example, in fact, um, actor kind of banked on this to keep his job was Spike in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, so James Marcus has said that he intentionally played the character as more sympathetic so that he could stick around and be employed. And it worked. People, even when he was terrible, really liked the character because they could relate to him. Um, you know, he kind of, he's an interesting arc. He kind of went from like a straight up villain to a sympathetic villain to an anti-hero. Um, and yeah, so... You can have your views on if that was a good choice or not, but I can't deny that it is a good example of a sympathetic villain 
and what makes a sympathetic villain. It is, again, no ideals, but we can as human beings relate to wanting to be important, to wanting to have love, to want connection. Um, Yeah, Drusilla also, though, she was, I, I, yeah, I definitely understand what the going mad, but at a certain point, I don't know, I, it didn't, she didn't quite have the same craving for connection and the motivation that we as people could understand. And I think that was, that's kind of the thing is a sympathetic villain works because we can relate to what they want. And it's, it's, it's a little hard to relate to somebody driving you mad by slaughtering your whole family. I hope it's hard for you to relate to that. Um. Yeah. Um. So those are kind of, yep, anti-hero in a lot of ways. Yeah, there's a lot of anti-heroes. Like I said, I think in today's day and age, an anti-hero is a more common protagonist than a hero. And I think in the setting of a sim, most of our PCs are going to be more anti-hero in a lot of ways. Um, the reason being, you can get a little too idealistic. You produce what I call a spotlight character, if you kind of go full hero, which is the expectation that the spotlight will be on you all the time. You know, it's all about me. It's all about me. You can call it a Mary Sue. You can call it power gaming. You can call it, you know, whatever you want. At the end of the day, I think it's important to remember that simming is cooperative. And because we are not mechanics driven, even more than many role playing games, we are cooperative. So it's both easy to hog the spotlight and inappropriate. So ultimately, what makes a good antagonist from a bad antagonist? Um, I actually was trying to come up with examples of bad antagonists and I had a horrible time because I realized you don't remember the bad antagonists. You don't remember the ones who don't work unless it, I think Skeletor worked in the context of his uh, story. Um, but, you know, a bad antagonist is ultimately kind of one who's forgettable who you don't care about. Um, eh, I, I don't, I think most antagonists never achieve their goals. Um, but so one of the things about a good tank is that they have to have some kind of power. Otherwise you don't have an antagonist. You have an annoyance. Um, you know, Barkley could have been like a small, low grade antagonist because of his social issues, but mostly he wasn't because he was just annoying. <laughs> um, you know, he could have been almost sort of a cue sometimes on, you know, an antagonist, sometimes not. Yeah. So, yeah, there are a few out there, but you'll notice for the most part, it's hard to think of ones where you're like, I just didn't care. Um. So a good antagonist needs some measure of power. They need to be some kind of threat. Um, you know, if we go back to some of our previous examples, um, Bruce the shark had the capability of eating people. Now, he had limitations. He could not go up on land, but he could eat people. Um, Calvin's parents have a lot of power over him. And again, it's, it's in check. There are limits, but they have a lot of power. They need a motivation. They need something that gives them purpose. Um, and it needs to be a motivation that makes sense. Uh, I think we can all kind of, you know, we've all played with somebody who maybe uh, Mythbusters determined a lot of stuff was, was, was not possible. Um, I, 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 rule of Hollywood, I will give speed that. So, a good villain has motivation. We talked about Dukat and Kai Wen and their motivations a little bit earlier. You know, Dukat ultimately is motivated by 
his own personal desires. He will do what is right for himself based off what he wants. He has no grander view of the universe in a lot of ways. He acquired power within Cardassia because it gave him what he wanted. Um, Kai Wynn thinks, or at least tries to convince herself that she is motivated, you know, by the good of the Bajoran people and keeping the Bajorans, you know, untainted by the, out, you know, this human who's been granted prophet's blessing. And um, now in a lot of ways, it's also, I want to be important in her case. I want, you know, um, but she at least tries to make it about other people. Um, so a common motivation is, is simply, it's what I, I want. I want this because it makes me happy. I want power. I want money. I want, uh, you know, 101 puppies to make a coat out of. Um, now, it's not always going to be that selfish. You are going to have, again, your kind of non-villain protagonists who it might be, I want to uphold law and order. I want my kid, you know, and a lot of young adult, uh, young adult uh, fiction, it's going to be adults who are like, I want my kid to grow up to not be a delinquent. I want them to be, you know, forthright and successful. Um, but there needs to be some purpose to it that we can kind of understand. Um, relate to that is the character needs a goal. They need a plan of action driven by their motivation. So I'm going to steal these Dalmatian puppies because I want a coat made out of their fur. I have a motivation. I have a plan of action. These come together to create the threat that is me because I have the power to do these things. Um, one interesting thing, you know, is I will note here is horror and comedy, which are, well, there's a lot been done about how those are closely related. Um, they usually play with a mismatch of motivation and goal. So Stephen King's Carrie, Carrie White, very understandable motivation. I have been humiliated in front of the whole school. I want revenge. The goal is a little out of balance with that because her response is to slaughter the entire school. Um, similar, you know, Patricia Voorhees in the first uh, Friday the 13th movie, which I, if you have been, I, I hope I'm not spoiling it for anyone, but it's been, you know, 40 years. So that's not on me. Um, mad that her son was allowed to drown because the camp counselors weren't paying attention. So she goes on to murder a bunch of other camp counselors who, if they were even born when her son died, were infants. Completely out of proportion. Um, flip side also, you know, Wiley Coyote again. This time played for comedy. I want to capture the Roadrunner. Therefore, I'm going to get some roller skates and a giant rocket, and I'm going to strap the rocket to my back. You'd think he could just order a sandwich from Acme if he was that hungry. And finally, an antagonist needs limits. Um, you can't really have, in a, you know, if, if they can get what they want, which is a snap of their fingers... You know, it, it's not interesting. There's no tension. Um, limits can be external or internal. So it can be a limit on how far they're willing to go, um, which is an internal, or how far they can go, which is external. So, for instance, Q, omnipotent being, he had to put limits on himself to make the stories with him work. Um, his were pretty much all internal. He's like, I'm willing to do this much. Because I'm omnipotent and I could do a whole lot more, but I'm not going to. Um, Ducat, you know, the flip side, he had a limit of what he was capable of doing. He tried to get the Pavarets involved, and but, you know, he under his own power, he was just a guy. Um, especially kind of once he broke with Cardassia and was running around on his own. Um, limit to what he could do. 
So the second half of this we're going to talk about is how do we take all this and how do we bring it into our game? So there are two potential ways we can have antagonists within the game. And a lot of it depends on different factors. You have everything from your petty bureaucratic annoyance um, all the way up to, you know, kind of your big bad of the season or your mission um, or the large arc. Um, so the first thing you really need to consider is what kind of, what's the scale of your antagonist here? And to kind of think of that, think about the level of threat and the consistency of the threat. Um, so, for instance, Quark is occasionally an antagonist rather than a protagonist. He kind of flips back and forth depending on the episode. He's not a really high level of threat. And he's not a very consistent level of threat. He is a very low level antagonist. On the other end, you have the Dominion who are huge. They have a huge level of threat they can present. They are constantly a threat. They're about, you know, they were the big bad of the whole series, not just a season, but pretty much the series. They started kind of seeding mentions of the Dominion into like as early as season two, I believe. Possibly season one. I'd have to go back and check. But they started seeding them very early on. Um, and third, Kind of example from uh, Deep Space Nine, which we haven't really talked about, Garrick. Garrick is actually a pretty high level threat. He's probably as high level a threat as Dukat in terms of what he is capable of doing. Um, but he's not really consistently a threat. He's, again, he, his motivation is primarily his own safety. And so. He's not really going to be a threat consistently unless you back him into a corner. So he's kind of a mid-level occasional. What happens with this is you need kind of, hopefully you're kind of picking up a little bit here, is you need to match the scale of the story to the scale of antagonist. You cannot have Quark be the big bad of your mission because it just doesn't make sense. Um, you could have him, you know, I mean, what is he going to do? He's going to, you know, sell you bad shit parts. And uh, then you're going to get stranded somewhere. And then pretty much the solution to the story is you never buy parts from Quark again. You know, he, he's not going to be this huge existential threat. The flip side, you cannot have something of the scale of the Dominion and defeat them in like one episode. That's just silly. That, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so very much anytime you're bringing in an antagonist, absolutely think about, does the scale of the story match the scale of my antagonist? Um, and there's always some wiggle room there, obviously. You know, sometimes you're going to, you're like, I'm going to have this low level one. They're going to come back a lot. And sometimes you're going to have a low level threat. And it's like, this is a one episode threat. Um, you know, we defeat them and we're done. Uh, but that is always, always kind of the underlying principle of how you balance antagonists and story. Because otherwise your players are going to get really annoyed with you. Um, so one thing to do is, this is both, I think, as um, your C a CO, GM, whatever term you want to use, or as a player, can Consider working together always. Um, it's very easy, I think, for the GM to consistently portray the bad guys. My background on role playing, I've done a combination of tabletop, LARP, simming, you name it. And I think for the in person version of um, simming, LARP is probably closest. And one advantage you can do is you can have players playing bad guys in cooperation with the GM and under their direction. It can get interesting because as your players are less likely to expect it to come from that direction. So if you've ever been a, uh, yep, if you've ever been a player and you're going, I really want to play a bad guy. Well, talk to your, 
talk to your GM about it. A really good GM is going to be open to, hey, I have this idea. I want to do this thing. Um, but don't do it without your GM. <laughs> Uh, the one difference between LARP and simming is simming is a lot more cooperative. LARP is often player versus player, so you can get away with a little more without involving the game lead. But um, in simming, yeah, always, always talk to your GM. A really good GM is going to be like, we can do that. Here's how we can work it in. Um, and think about the type of story you want to explore. Um, there are kind of basically four ways to play an antagonist within a sim, in my opinion, that I can think of. There might be more, and if anyone else thinks of something else, I would love to hear it. First is a negative arc where you have, you know, your character who maybe you're like, I've gone through something really traumatic and I want him to go, you know, the break bad of, you know, the, the story. I, I want him to go decide that this is all, you know, terrible and I want to be a bad guy. Um, peanut hamper kind of in the first one. Oh look you're asking things of me never mind I, I i'm just gonna leave i'm not gonna involve myself with this i'm gonna run away and you're all gonna hate me now maybe a little more elaborate than that but um yep <laughs> peanut hamper is hilarious um if only for the name the flip side of course is your positive arc um, which is the reverse. You have a bad guy who kind of goes through, you know, the redemption and becomes, if not a hero, at least a neutral issue. Um, you know, you can kind of, in some ways, say like Seven of Nine had very much a positive arc. She went from Borg drone to independent member of the crew. Um you could also argue that uh, that was not necessarily positive for her, and it depends on if you're looking at it from the point of view of Voyager or the Borg or what have you, but that's kind of an example of, you know, going in a positive arc and becoming more integrated from an outsider to the insider. Um, your reincurrent antagonist is, of course, a classic of Star Trek. Um, they had antagonists both on the species level and the individual level who we would see multiple times. And then, you know, the huge advantage here is, of course, is you get more invested over time. Um, Q was a reoccurring one um, on Next Generation. Um, Goody is better than Badgie there. So, <laughs> Goody. Good, good G. I, bleh, that, that's awkward to say. Um, and of course, your ever classic season, Big Bad. Um, which is interesting because it really only came, became a thing around the time, like in the 90s, with DS9 as much. Um, just because of the way television shifted to more of a seasonal story arc. But, you know, you, that's out there, that's available. Um, so those are the kind of the types. And one thing to go in is kind of knowing what do you want to do with it? Because if you're a little too open-ended, you're kind of going to get bogged down. You know, the antagonist is there to be in opposition to the protagonist. Um, so if you kind of leave it too open-ended, what happens, I think, in my experience has been, they kind of meander off into their own story and they stop being in opposition to the protagonist as much. Finally, if you're going to do something like this, you need to be prepared to mostly fail in character. Not as a player, but in character. Because generally, we are not playing tragedies or horror. The protagonists are going to win. That's kind of the whole point, you know, I think, of the genre of tragedy and horror is that they upend that assumption that the hero wins. So. We're playing with that assumption. The good guys, are, there might be losses along the way, um, but ultimately the good guys come out on top. Star Trek is at least attempting to be a utopia. Um, so the antagonists, yeah, they don't get to win. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Um, if you're looking to do that, what you're really getting to is two groups of protagonists in conflict with each other. And that would be a very different talk altogether. Everyone, yeah, like I said, you sort of. Except Sherlock came back, so he kind of didn't win. It was short term. And I think, you know, that, again, with, with the longer stories, that's why I say to mostly fail. You may succeed at individual steps because, oh, sorry, my brain goes Moriarty and immediately goes to the Sherlock, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, not to the TNG episode. So. Um. But, um, yeah, you know, even when you win a lot of times as an antagonist, it's going to be short term because, again, Star Trek is, is, is meant to be a utopia. And I know they've played a lot with that in some of the more recent series, but I think the possibility that we can do better still underlines the series in general. And I think um, if we start moving away from that, I think it becomes something, I think it's less Star Trek and more just something else. And obviously there are Sims out there that are not Star Trek. This being Kittimer is a little Star Trek heavy. Um, but yeah, that that's kind of what I seek in Star Trek is, is the idea that we can be better and we can always strive to do better. All right, I finished here. It's about 10 minutes. So any questions or comments? Thank you. Uh, how do you keep them relevant in the background of the cruise story? Um, I'll be honest. I think, again, Deep Space Nine and Leverage are kind of ones I go back to, examples that have done this well, which is a lot of uh, kind of seeding early on before they're the reveal. Um, so, for instance, in DS9, we hear just a mention of the Dominion as a power um, in the Gamma Quadrant long before we ever see them. Um, you know, and, and I, I, I recognize that, you know, pulling the strings from the shadows is a little bit of a uh, <laughs> cliche, but um, I think it's used a lot for a reason. Um, the other thing kind of you can do is, is kind of map out through your season intentional uh, peripheral encounters. Um, so, for instance, you have a sub story where they encounter the victims of your your big bad, your overarching big bad. Um, you know. Yep. And I think, you know, it doesn't have to be a perfect, like, line of linking. Um, sometimes I think we get too bogged down in the details. Think about you have to leave a little bit of room for your other people's characters to kind of breathe and move. Um, but, yeah, remember that it's not just the direct connection to that big bad, but also that there's, um, what's the word I want to, a kind of a penumbra of impact that it surrounds them and have them encounter the penumbra more than the big bad to work up to it. Any other questions? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, like, for instance, again, DS9, I kind of, uh, it was the first season, it was with the Scria. They came through the, uh, from the Gamma Quadrant, they were refugees. We never really found out exactly what they were fleeing, but it kind of set the idea that there's conflict in the Gamma Quadrant, 
Um, I've always long suspected that they were kind of behind the, uh, the Dominion was kind of behind that. Um, and it's the nice thing about something like that is uh, maybe the writers didn't think of it at that point, but they can always go back and say, yes, yes, that, that, that's how it worked. Universe change. Ooh, interesting. Is it a koala? <laughs> uh, nothing to do with the next one. Yeah, you know, you can also... Um, yeah, it doesn't always have to be one plot at a time. You know, and never be afraid to actually, like, sit down. Have you ever seen, um, what, is it XKCD that did them? But they, they kind of mapped out some of the main character lines of common stories. Um, never be afraid to, like, sit down and just sort of sketch out multiple plot lines. Um, because, you know, sometimes the key is not having a single plot line. It's having, like, you know one big arc and then several arcs under it or overlapping arcs. Or, uh, I think with simming, because a lot of players will also kind of have their own kind of mini subplots going, but in character interaction, you get a lot of overlap in terms of the arcs. It's not one at a time. And that's not a bad thing, I think. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that idea of you have you know, wide open and maybe it's not so idealistic. I think that even goes back, not just DS9, but all the way back to the original series where, you know, it was, you know, we were supposed to go out there and explore and, and contact, you know, new life. And it's not always friendly. And sometimes it's the Gorn and they want to lay eggs in you. Um. So, yeah, that uh, is certainly one way to do it. Um, now, you can, of course, do a singular, like DS9 with the Dominion. Um, you can do more like TOS with multiple smaller ones. That's kind of, I think, comes down to your comfort and how juggling long-term plot. Um, and I think that's something that comes mostly with practice. Uh, and some people are always going to be better at it than others. Um, everyone's got their skills, takes all kinds. Um, you know, if we were all doing the exact same thing, it would get really boring really fast because we wouldn't need each other. We could just all sit and write our stories and they'd be all the same. All right. We're about five minutes before the end. Um, unless there's any other questions, I'll close here so everyone has a chance to grab water or a bio break or anything before the next set of panels. Any last questions? Glad everyone uh, enjoyed it and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. All right, I'm gonna end now. Looks like everyone's got their questions answered. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>